Oh, yeah, are you recording now? Yep. This audio am I using? It's right here. It's here? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. You can just stay you right there. You'll be fine. Me. Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, great. All right, if you were in the room, you got to hear a great introduction yeah. and you get pizza. So <laughs> hope everybody comes in person when they can, but thank you also for joining online. Um, really appreciate it. One more time, we'll do the interaction thank really you. short. Um, I'm really excited, an old colleague that I worked with for a long time, Sarah Miller from Lidos, a real life in the flesh data scientist. She's been a data scientist for four and a half years. Um, so she's here to answer questions uh, about what it's like to be a data scientist in the in the world and what tools she uses, her tech stack, what skills you know she finds important. Um, so I'm gonna let her take it away and, and feel free to jump in and ask questions. All right, thanks. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, like David said, um, my name's Sarah. Um, I used to work with David uh, up until what, this past year. Um, so I'm excited to be back, see David, see new faces, and hopefully, um, I can make an impact and you guys will get a lot out of this presentation. Um, I have mostly tips and just my experience and thankfully my experience has been very positive. Um, so hopefully it will be motivating for you guys as you um, continue to check through your courses. <laughs> so this is an ask me anything session and um, I definitely want you guys to feel comfortable asking anything. I'm happy, like very happy to help. Um, Okay, so who am I? Um, I am a recent graduate of Johns Hopkins um, University. I just recently got my master's in applied and computational mathematics um, from the Whiting School of Engineering. I did that working full time. Um, it was a very challenging program, but also very rewarding, where I worked on research um, for the first time. Um, and I went to a liberal arts school in undergrad, so I didn't have a lot of the opportunities that I had when I went to Johns Hopkins. Um, also about me, I've been married for five years now, um, believe it or not. We met at a donut shop on a Wednesday afternoon, and we were married two years after that. Um, so yeah, my, my husband, big part of my life, as well as my family. And uh, the picture on the far right, um, I'm a big fan of going to concerts. Um, so this summer, I went and I saw Glass Animals. Um, I don't know if you guys know them, but it's okay. I'm kind of nerdy. <laughs> Check them out. That's Dave. Um, I think they're British or something, and I guess they're pop. But yeah, I just love going to concerts and um, just adventuring around the area. I don't travel far for concerts, though. It's like an hour under. Um, I'm lazy in that regard. What's your favorite venue? Um, <laughs> I actually went to a venue in DC called the Songbird. Oh, and there's yeah. another one called Culture. Um, that's more like EDM though. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah. Songbird's I, small, right? It's really small. Yeah. I saw um Hillary Duff's husband, Matthew Coma. Um, yeah, he's in a band. Anyway. <laughs> cool. Um, so like I said, my background, um, I went to a smaller liberal arts school um for college. I got a uh, bachelor's degree in mathematics and I minored in data science. Um, so when I was in college, data science had just become a thing. Like we were the first people to have a, a data science minor. And um, I was friends with a girl who created the data science major at my college. Data science was not really a buzzword, but it was up and coming. Um, so something that I was thinking about preparing for this was how many opportunities that you guys have here at GW and that data science is booming right now. Um, you're so much further ahead than we were um, a, a few years ago. Um, and that's really where I found data science and fell in love with mathematics and statistics and learned how to code in Python. Um, I mentioned Johns Hopkins already and David mentioned, mentioned uh, Lighters for me. Um, I'm a senior data scientist there now. Um, so in the past four and a half, five years, I've been promoted. Oops. Oh, no. Can somebody mute? Thank you. Oh, That's okay. <laughs> um, in the past uh, four and a half years, I've been promoted um, three times, which is pretty awesome. And um, I would just say that they've provided opportunities for me to grow daily. And I wake up amped to go to work, um, like literally excited every day. Like Sunday night, I'm not dreading work. I'm like, I just want to get there. I have lots of things to solve. Um, 
a lot of great people to work with. Um, and I've just been fortunate to have a positive experience there and great managers. Um, so next slide. Just a little bit about my career path and how I got here. Um, it was helpful for me when I was in college to see that from other people. So I, um, I participated in college internships all throughout uh, my undergraduate career. Um, I started with the Naval Research Enterprise Internship Program. I dropped the link there if you guys haven't heard of it, um, but it's a science and engineering program for undergraduate and graduate students where you pick labs that you want to go to across the nation and you pick top three and they'll send you, if you get accepted, they'll send you to one of those. Um, so the first year I applied, I was sent to um, Camp Pendleton in San Diego and also 29 Palms um, where I got to see the most recent military technologies and um, evaluate how the Marine Corps was using them and see how they were game. Um, so that was with the Marine Corps War Fighting Laboratory. Um, in that internship, I didn't have a lot of data science experience. It was, I was actually out in the field <laughs> with the Marines, um, collecting data, like very old school. So not the most technical, but um, it really made an impact on my resume. Um, and also when it came to interviews, have a lot of content and interesting things to talk about. The following two to three internships were also were very technical. Um, so I leveled up with NREP and I worked for the Naval Surface Warfare Center. Um, that's in Dogren, Virginia. It's kind of near Maryland, <laughs> near Southern Maryland. But in that internship, um, I had to basically learn the basics of C++ over the weekend, like from a, I got a C++ for dummies wow. book. Because I didn't know that going into the internship. Um, and so over like in two days, I read, read the book on my vacation and then showed up for work and, um, worked closely with electrical engineers to help me fill in the gaps because you can't learn C++ <laughs> in two days. Um, but it was a college internship, so a different level, different expectations. Um, that was a really cool internship where I was taking um, MathWorks uh, Simulink diagrams and converting them into actual C++ code. Um, at the end of that internship, they told me there's like a button to do that. Um, and I was not allowed to use that button. <laughs> so um, I had a lot of good experience there, just finding new tech, finding a new technology, having to pick it up quickly and then apply it and do that in front of engineer, like, you know, SMEs and present at the end of the internship what I did. Um, so that was with, um, there's a weapons computing control systems branch that I worked with to develop um, the C++ code for them for their control systems. Um, and similar experience uh, in 2018, in summer of 2018, I just got to do another part of that system. And then in 2019, um, I converted to a full-time government employee. It was government for one month, but I did the Pathways internship for a summer while I was finishing up my degree at Mary Washington. Um, I decided not to continue on that route because they didn't have data science or um, much work related to like statistics. It was a lot of software development. Um, so I was really motivated to be a data scientist and focused on that. So I just, I decided to leave and take um, all the good things with me <laughs> and try and make an impact um, at another company. Um, I think that's changed now. Um, I was talking last week at a conference with the Center of Medicaid and Medicare, and they have a whole team of data scientists. So I think that's, yeah, at least some places in the government are um, changed. Yeah, so I was, yeah, that's a- But great, you were an early <laughs> data yeah, scientist. Yeah, and I was also in a very rural area. Mm. Um, and so there, and I was working in a department um, where they were just starting to ramp up data science and- um, there, I was looking for mentors, like people I could, um, like mentors as managers. <laughs> um, and I would have probably been the one with some of the more, most data science experience, but that's not what I wanted right out of college. Um, but like David said right now, yeah, data science is everywhere now. Um, it's still booming and, uh, yeah, people would have a very different experience now and understand why I would want to do data science at the company. Um, then I went to Booz Allen, the junior operations research analyst. 
Um, fun fact, that's what data science used to be called back in like the 80s. Um, <laughs> and and I, um, I wasn't there for very long, but I did learn VBA. I worked with the Marine Corps again. And then when I got to Lidos, I was a real data scientist. I had the title and I was doing the work associated with it. Um, so I've supported a variety of um, multiple government clients so far. Um, and I can go into detail more about the skills I was using and the experiences I had. Um, but I had a very positive experience like working at Lidos. It's very technical. Um, I don't do a lot of slideshows or presentations um, just when we have executives asking or, you know, status updates every two weeks. Um, thankfully, I don't have to do a lot of writing yet. <laughs> um, so I can, I'll go into a little bit more detail. And no, anyone, any questions so far? Everything's clear. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. You guys all want to be data scientists or you already are one. <laughs> Um, so this is a slide that um, I actually found from a lunch and learn from OpenShift, which is like similar to a like Kubernetes. Um, is it, it's similar to Kubernetes. So I had found this uh, slide and something was very funny about it because I looked at the little tiny segment of what a data scientist should be doing. And in my experience, we do all of that, all the way from the business leadership down to the IT operations. It's just depending on the scale. So these are all things that, um, at least in my experience of projects I've been on, never have I ever had a data engineer or a um, data engineer come with data already, um, unless it's like a customer who says like, hey, I have this data, go do X with it. Um, you have to go get your own data. <laughs> and you have to know the tools to do that and understand a lot more. Um, now that I'm doing more software development um, on the team I'm on now, we actually do have an app developer. We have a UI person, we have data scientist, and then the roles have kind of separated. So it's very interesting. Um, on one team, you're expected to do all of this um, and learn it on the spot. <laughs> and then on this team, I can actually say, Hey, I think this is like for the UI person to do. I'm just going to let them do that. <laughs> um, and we actually, on um, the team I'm on now, it's very unique because um, it's a, we're developing software, but it was staffed with uh, data scientists. <laughs> so all of us have been asked to do like formal software development um, and agile. We're doing agile. <laughs> um, which is not something that as a data scientist, we were really expected to do. Um, so it's been very positive. I've been learning a lot. Um, there have been, it has just made me so aware of how many tools I don't know and how much information there is to learn. Um, and on the other hand, I've been working with SMEs who they're just like troves of information. Um, and I definitely appreciate that if you're working with SMEs, you'll get a lot, you'll get a lot more out of it too, I think. Um, do people know what agile development is? Do you have, do, do, do you know? They've heard of it maybe, or use it. Not use it. Not okay. use it, but heard of it. Um, Learning it, about it, but not in, not, don't have any practical experience. Oh yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I just barely have some um, just this year, but it's a, um, it's a software development methodology being applied to other areas, as my mom says, <laughs> <laughs> um, where you have, um, I think, I think Agile fits better if you're doing actual software development, because as a data scientist, a lot of what you're doing is research. So having to time box your research, and then when the solution you implement doesn't work, you have to create like an issue for that. Um, but as a data scientist, it's just a constant, like you're always iterating, you're always trying to improve. There's not a lot of time where you say, oh, I have a bug, I fixed it with this solution, it's done. Um, obviously, software development is also very complex, so there's more to it than that. Um, but at the conceptual level, is how it, that's how it feels. Having having done a lot of software development for <laughs> industry, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't trying to throw you under the bus. But, um, 
over my career before agile was a thing um what used to happen is you would gather all your requirements for a new tool um, and then you would spend like a year for a big system trying to build out this tool, this new system. And then you would present it to the users and they would say, this is horrible. This doesn't do what I wanted it to do. This is awful. Um, and so Agile is a new way where you you do incremental updates and incremental releases. You have a two week cycle, which is called a sprint. You have a scrum master who manages all the tasks and all the interdependencies and the resources. And, and you you scope things very clearly for each developer to know exactly like this is going to take i think one day to do and you put it there you put it in a task as an issue uh, and then you, you you know sometimes you have delays sometimes you get things done ahead of time rarely in my experience um and so and and then you deliver something like after two weeks you deliver some new capability a new feature to that the users can see and and say yes this is good or no and so it's sort of a fail fast mentality um where you can you can get things out there and and, and make changes on the fly um and it's much better in my experience and i'm curious um if it can apply to data science i feel like data science is almost faster paced than that where you're you're like need to prototype things and do things so quickly so yeah so i actually really like agile <laughs> Probably I didn't introduce it very well, but I do like Agile, as you'll see, like from some of my tips, like why it works for me. Um, but yeah, for for data science, uh, what we're finding is that we don't really plan out the entire, it's going to make you cringe, the entire program increment, which has like four or five sprints. We try to plan for all of that and then sprint by sprint. That's when we keep adding more things and carrying things over. Um, because like we have to, um, we don't necessarily have things planned out a year ahead of time. We're kind of learning and developing at the same time. Um, and at the end of the sprint, I'm always, um, sometimes I'm scrambling <laughs> to get things done because it is hard to, to, to time box um, certain things. Um, but I think it's a very positive skill to have because it teaches you to set goals and estimate how long it'll take you to do something. And it's also good for breaking down really complex tasks. Um, and especially for something like software development, I couldn't imagine how it would be done without Agile. It just it just wouldn't make any sense. I would be, um, I'd be swimming. <laughs> Can you talk about what some of your tasks are like? Yeah, so um, most recently uh, with the uh, software that we're building, most of the data science tasks have, follow a similar workflow um, where we, I mean, in terms of Agile, um, we have an, an epic, uh, which is basically the big objective that we want to accomplish. And underneath the epic, we have stories. And each of those stories, there's about seven now, where it basically goes through our workflow that around the team of data scientists, we've all agreed, like, this is how we've been doing it where we research the problem, um, we evaluate like the models uh, that we that we find and provide metrics. And then there's a front end integra integration, a back end integration. And then if you're using a distributed task queue, you have to implement that into a task. So we're up to five or six different things. Um, and each of those have similar story points associated with them. So we know if we're going over um, we rarely go under <laughs> because we like time to do things, but, um, yeah, if we're going over, it's a good guideline for, okay, maybe we should stop researching this. Maybe we have really found everything that we need. Um, can you give them an example of what an Epic might be? It's like a feature, yes, right? Yeah. Yes. So an Epic would be a feature. So let's say if I'm building a software and I want it to do, um, object detection. So your feature would be you know, basically in very informal term, in terms, add object detection to, you know, software. And then underneath the stories, that's when you break things out and you have acceptance criteria. Um, one of the biggest things that I didn't, that I'm still learning to implement is having time within your story to do uh, merger, like merge requests and have people review your code and what does it mean to be done? It's not always right the first time. <laughs> not always right the first time. 
um, and having to test code, writing formal pie tests, like that's um, when I went through the <laughs> data science and my first few years, that was like no such thing. Um, I knew it existed, but I didn't have to deal with it. And now when I'm writing code, that is exactly how I test my code. Um, and when I go back to work on you know, like pure data science projects, I find myself importing PyTest, like needing to be like, well, how do I know this is going to work every time? Um, it's a good plug. We just did PyTest like oh, weeks great. ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, another shameless plug, um, type validation with Pydantic. I don't know if anyone uses that, but basically, yeah, I don't, I hardly do anything anymore without validating that the input to the function matches the exact um, data structure that I want. And it's very helpful if you're writing um, like fast API routes, um, as well as like writing to databases. So you might be familiar with like SQL Alchemy. It's basically a wrapper over Pydantic. So that way the data you write to the database is exactly what you're expecting. Um, so you can kind of circumvent errors that SQL will throw. Um, if you try to write like a none value to a database, it'll basically say, hey, that's not allowed. It should be a string and this is what you're missing. Um, this is actually a good, um, a good dialogue um, for this slide because as you can probably tell, <laughs> Um, just by explaining my tasks, we really do go through all of those different um, steps in the life cycle. Um, it's just at a smaller scale. And when you're on a, like a formal software development program, you will have um, more well-defined roles um, over time. Oops, wow, that one too. So I call this slide a tech stack. Um, this is a slide I found like open source on the internet. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I had considered going through and creating my own tech stack, um, but there's, there's a lot there. And so I found this tech stack, um, a lot of, I've used a lot of these tools and the other point of the slide, um, as I've been mentioning is that you have to be able to learn these tools quickly. So even, so there's tools on there that you don't know based on your project, you could be expected to pick them up and implement them very quickly. Um, and that's actually a good skill to have. Um, and once you use one Python package, you can kind of develop skills for how to imp implement another one. Um, I'd say the hardest part is the um, soft, like learning a software like Elasticsearch, like database querying. Um, that's a little bit more involved um, if you really get into the weeds of it. But I would just like encourage everybody to use all the pack when you have this time um, in undergrad or grad school, learn a lot of <laughs> the packages that you can. Um, and I'd say especially AWS or yeah, Elastic. So as a data scientist, do you have to determine which packages that, that you want to use and like go out and do a review and try to figure it out and assess the landscape? Or does somebody else kind of tell you this is what we're going to use? And you just have to learn it. We um we have to go out and find the software that we're going to use, and then we have to learn it and teach it to others. <laughs> if you have others on the team that aren't as familiar, um, um, and that happens at a project like non technical level as well, um, where I was put on a project on a Friday, and the Monday the interns arrived, and I had to explain to them the whole point of the contract, what are they going to do? And oh, by the way, here's your technical project that aligns to it. Um, so that was fun <laughs> where the data scientist, the um, internship data scientists and I were trying to figure out the mission as we went, as well as design an entire project. Um, yeah, yeah. Going out for finding the software, how helpful and possible to get so the question um, I don't know if people could hear was um, how do you use generative AI to help you find what software to use and how much do you use generative AI in your work? And Yeah, so um, I don't use generative AI to like help me find the package. Um, I probably sound very old right now. 
Um, <laughs> I do use it, but um, I don't use it to say like, hey, what package can do this? Like I use just like basic searches. And then I also talk with my teammates who've had decades of experience. They can kind of, they know the lay of the land and they can basically say, yeah, this one's pretty good. You can try it, this one. Um, I actually am, I'm using generative AI um, like for coding, but on a very small scale. Like when I'm doing my Google searches and the generative AI summary comes up, I found that to be very helpful, um, but it's very rare that I actually go to like, um, like an a generative AI web page and like enter like, hey, how do I code this function? Um, like in, directly. In your defense, um, and people will see this as they get into industry, um, if you're doing an open public project, you can use AI. You don't have any worries maybe about, you know, the the, the bots, you know, eating your information. But <laughs> if you're a proprietary company, it's they will not let you. You can't upload your code. You will get fired. You will have a huge data leak. Like it's a massive problem. So and if you have a clearance that you, re, you, it, you know, that's doubled. So it's it's just very, you have to be careful like about what you put into chat GPT or any of these things. If you're working for a company, even if you're doing it as a research, you have to make sure, you know, that any private data you should not be sharing. Those are not private spaces. So you just have to be careful. Yeah. And we do, I do have several teammates who have, um, who are using like generative AI for coding help. Um, I don't, I don't know. I feel like I've been busy with so many other things. I just so, keep doing what works for me. But yeah, most of my teammates, they say that it's a huge time saver. Um, I just find the easiest way to use it. It's just, yeah. When I was summaries. when I was doing my work, you know, I would do use Stack Overflow and, and ask Google a million questions to find the answers. I would still use ChatGPT, yeah. but you would you have to be careful not to like take any code. And often the code is not classified. It's the the data or you know, stuff or, or, you know, sensitive. So, but sometimes it is so often the code is proprietary. So you have to be careful that you can ask it questions, but you don't necessarily want to cut and paste proprietary code. You don't want to yeah, cut and paste proprietary that. code and say, can you make this better? Can you find the bug? Can you, you know, like that's, that's not a good idea. Um, but the good thing is that everybody is very excited about generative AI. So as a data scientist, you pretty much have, um, you have a lot of free will and like, when you want to adapt generative AI to your project. Um, so that's like on the other end of it is that you might, you may or may not be able to ask it specific questions, but you might be able to put it into your own environment and then deploy it for the customer to use. Um, so that's the other side of it. It's not like um, we don't ever use it. It's just, we're careful about when we use it and um, we use it when we need it. Um, hopefully that, did you have a question? Yeah, so I have a question. Sure. So in the industry, I just I just have a question that uh, how often do we use um, data modeling or it's just data analysis in the data science, like using like deep learning and applying learning tools? Yeah, very often. Um, um, yeah, so the question was how often do we use um, data modeling or data analytics um, as well as like machine learning models and deep yeah, learning? Machine. Data, data analytics we usually use like the base, but the like the whole part of the data set that is like deep learning, then machine learning algorithms. So how often do we use it? Um, we use like simulating and working, LSTM, all those models. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So how often do we use um like different uh, deep learning deep or machine learning? learning? like pure data science techniques um, for our work. Um, we use it very often. It depends on the use case. Um, but speaking for myself and my teammates, um, some of us will develop our own models and methods and train our own models, just like you do in your projects now. Um, and sometimes the use case is that an open source model exists. And because just the nature of the work we do, um, you have to do it very quickly. We always go to open source first if, if it exists and we can maybe um, like fine tune it or adapt it to our problem. That's a big win versus having to like train it start from scratch, build our own model from scratch. Um, but I will say like there are 
so many opportunities where we could do that. Um, and we do have more time to develop that approach. Yeah. So like when we are actually using all these yeah. ways, so it's a bit complicated. Mm -hmm. So for that, we need AI help at some point. And like during that situation, is like is it allowed to use generative AI or it's not it doesn't do um, yeah, I think if it's an open, if it's open source, like if what you're asking and what you want out of it and what you're putting into it is open source, mm -hmm. that's more, um, that's a better use case for generative AI. Okay. So if you're asking things that you could, might take you longer, but you could probably find like on the internet and open source documentation, that's information that LLM, sorry, generative AI, Whatever you want to call it, it's information the generative AI model already has. Mm -hmm. um, and you can always, I always like talk with my manager. I mean, I don't even put my email into things like when I'm at work. Like I always ask my manager, can I even use my email to sign up and get access to this, <laughs> this <laughs> chat bot? So um, it's not so much that you're going to like go off and like make a mistake like that. It's more that will give you everything and tell you how and when you can use it. Um, and yeah, it's we're always looking for ways to do things like smarter and faster. <laughs> and thankfully, um, from like my managers, they've been very um, encouraging about that. And I haven't had any experiences where people are like, no, I'm probably the most strict about it, honestly. <laughs> I think it's a, if you're taking something that's internal, and maybe bringing it out, that's when you really have to worry. But if you're yeah. taking something that's external and you're bringing it in, I don't think it's you have as many worries. And using it like you are right now, I mean, you're using it as a tool and it's helping you. So it's not like you're going to not have access to that or not be able to use it. Like the point is that you're learning <laughs> the content that it's giving you um, and you know how to ask the right questions and put it together. So um yeah, probably learning plenty, but <laughs> probably learning more yeah. using it. Also, like most of the companies, they have their own generative AI app. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, they do. Um, yeah, we we can. Yeah, we can use internal models as well. Um, it's just a matter of getting those. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It is a very exciting time though. This is not around <laughs> when I went through the program. So I'm excited to hear you guys like asking these questions. Um, so I have a question. Sure. As we're also thinking now about our spring schedule. So out of your staff, we've covered maybe five of them. We've covered Spark, we've covered Glass. What would be the ones you would prioritize that you think students should be at least exposed to like you've done a little AWS that's been very like specific. Like we use this tool out of AWS and that was it. Huh. I I would say um Kubernetes and Docker okay. and Jenkins. <laughs> Just Gas. getting that whole what's that? Gas. I haven't used that specifically, okay. but others have. Um and these are things like I look at this tech stack and there's things on here that I want to know <laughs> and that I wish I had. I should have a slide for what I wish I had learned. Um, but yeah, I would prioritize more on the side of like, Docker. yeah. Like, I'm trying to get Lorena to do Docker. I tried and she told me to talk to her students because they uh -huh. do it all for her. <laughs> so, yeah. so are you Docker doing, so as a data scientist, like is your feature like to, com when it's complete, is it, a, is it an entire service that like has a, a, a Docker can, image container and and also an api you know and, and and you have to get that deployed as well like yes, to the, like the whole, whole that's the whole you have the whole job the whole job yeah yeah you start from like you hear a customer give you maybe one or two sentences about what they want it doesn't always line up with what you can do um but you have to take it all the way to here's an api can you talk you. through that like the whole process That'd oh, be yeah. really cool, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, see if I can do it off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, so in my experience, um, I've had customers, they ask, they say, hey, I want this. 
and it might be some buzzword in data science, you have to ask them the question, well, what do you really want? Sometimes it's not even a data science capability that they're asking for. They might not know. Um, when it is a data science capability, a lot of times how it works is you say, okay, like I've heard heard your request. You know, maybe you have an idea off the top of your idea off the top of your head. But the next, you know, 10 within 10 minutes of hearing that request, you're just researching, like <laughs> scanning open source documentation. You're talking with your teammates, like what did you have you had a problem like this? Um, so you get so uh, I guess the technical part of that is once you finish your research, research you start writing Python code, um, and then you decide if it needs a a user interface, um, whether that's like a front end, maybe like a little Streamlit app or something uh, written in Python, or it's an API, because you might be servicing this for data scientists who are also your customer. So it's you, you could be a data scientist trying to provide an API for another API for another data scientist. Maybe they have competing priorities and they can't do it themselves right now. So once you have your Python script, um, then you need your backend. Um, in this case, let's say fast API. So you're writing tests, make sure your backend works. And this is all happening within your local environment, like a Python virtual environment on your local machine. Um, and then you have to package, like containerize it. Um, we use Docker, you can also use Podman, that's open source as well. Um, we containerize it so that way, if they want to take it and put it on another virtual machine, they, they don't have to go and find all these packages themselves. It's all built into the Docker image. Um, then you run it. <laughs> you have the requirements TXT that has like exactly the packages that they Yeah, so you have the requirements TXT. Um, and recently we've been, every feature has is its own Python package as well. Um, so I've been getting more experience with that. I've made it this far <laughs> without <laughs> packaging up my code besides containerizing it. Um, so yeah, there's always something, probably a very basic thing, but um, something that you learn <laughs> sometimes on the job. Um, yeah, so it basically goes from like a couple sentences and deploying it, you have to understand a little bit about like networking and ports and IP addresses. And also um, a big part of that is communicating with your team and communicating with SMEs who are like really good at this stuff, like with networking, um, because you'll run into problems and you have to be able, well, you want to be able to use the proper terminology. So that way you can more effectively relay what the problem is. Um, and when you're going to SMEs, they're probably very busy. Um, so it's very helpful to try and um, come with an idea of why you think it's happening and um, be very informative. Like if you're seeing an error, you don't wanna say, hey, I'm getting an error. Like, what do, what do I do? It, it doesn't mean any anything other than you need help with something. But if you go and say like, hey, I'm getting this error after I did this, you know, and provide context, you get an answer a lot faster rather than starting from like, I have this error, it's just, you know, it's an open book. You have to give enough information so they can reproduce it. Right. Themselves. They want, yeah, reproduce it. Publish. What's that? Like a GitHub issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a GitHub issue. Um, Maybe reports follow some structure, like, like uh, do you have some structure like that? Oh, yeah. To create an issue so that uh, others can easily reproduce that. Yeah, so a lot of times when I have issues, I'm resolving them over chat or in person because um, it's all happening on like code internal um, to us. Um, and usually the issues are have issues are unique enough to the environment that we're working in. But for example, um, I always try to pr provide context about why I'm asking. Like I said, hey, I've I've searched, you know, I've done my research. Um, this is a problem I'm seeing. This is how people have solved it. This hasn't worked for me. Um, and then that's when you can like enter your question. So I always try to come with more information. Um, and show them that I've already tried to do my due diligence and solving it myself. Yeah. 
Um, with that being said, I, um, my teammates and I, we still have questions sometimes where um, one, of, one of my teammates is like, hey, I'm getting this error. And then I ask follow-up questions like, what does that even mean? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Um, so yeah, this, this is definitely a good skill to have is knowing how to ask questions and be informed as you can when you ask them. Um, it's just a lot faster. And they know exactly the problem you want to solve. You use an internal Git? Yes. Yes, we use GitHub and GitLab. Um, and then if Jink, I haven't implemented this yet, but I know I'm going to have to implement it. Um, if Jenkins isn't available, we will need to use GitLab runners. Um, so I'd be very familiar with all of GitLab. And that's something I didn't have a lot of experience with in college. Um, but I do have more experience with it now, especially doing formal development. Do you create issues via GitLab or do you use Jira for your tasking? I am the only one who creates issues in GitLab. <laughs> do people solve your issues though if you create them? I solve GitLab. my own issues. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, I, in my experience, um, most of my work, it happens very independently. We communicate with teammates um, for high level concepts, but um, most of the time we are working, we're very focused finding and solving our own issues um, just with the help of others. So um, a good thing with GitLab, the connection I've been making with GitLab and Jira that's been helpful is naming my feature branches, the ticket that I'm, or the Jira issue that I created. So if I'm working on issue like 6711, I'm going to create a GitLab branch that's, you know, whatever the uh, depost or something, 3711. So that way I can go back and look at it and know exactly what code, what the code was supposed to do when I added it to GitLab. And when I ask people to review my code, I can point them to all of this information about all the things I wanted to accomplish and what it's supposed to look like, and they can try to replicate it as well. Jira um, is an Atlassian tool um, that's a tasking project management yeah, kind of tool. Um, there was something else called Confluence that we used a lot to, to yeah. do documentation. Um, and then all, all these tools are starting to become interoperable so that you can like you said, share the, the knowledge and connect the dots. And so somebody can look in and see the history and track, you know, the, the, to, to find the point that, that you know, to, to make sense of, of it all. Yeah. I it's a lot of interdependencies. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just basically, um, my experience is what helps you implement agile pra mm -hmm. practices mm -hmm. is what I've experienced. Um, but like I said, I'm new to this as of like this year. <laughs> So I'm still learning. Um, you can do some of this directly in GitHub with mm -hmm. GitHub projects mm -hmm. and you can set it up, but Jira has like a really nice agile mm -hmm. focus that enables these sprints and everything to be like mapped out. Yeah, and it also helps you line up with your program. So um, if you're on a larger, medium or larger program, um, you might be on a team of data scientists of you know five or six people but you have to fit into the entire, there could be, I don't know, 10 task orders. Each task order has like 50, I don't know, 25, 50 people. Um, and for them, it makes even more sense for them to use Agile and Jira. So you have to just be able to kind of plug in and adapt. Um, and that's a lot of times, well, that's why we started using it. Um, we needed it and we also needed to keep it in line with the program and um, the customers like it too. <laughs> so they want to see that um, and it helps them understand exactly like what you're doing with your time. <laughs> yeah, I'd say work, you have to show them. <laughs> when you're independently developing, you don't need to worry about this stuff right. so much. Um, just kind of figure out your own management system. But once you had one person to collaborate with, you, you start to need to figure out how to, how do we make sure we're not doing the same work in deconflicting everything. It, it, there's a lot of tools out there that can help with that. Yeah, I've definitely had some like baby step moments where um, I actually started using like what I had mentioned earlier, using Jira ticket numbers as my branches. No one else 
clear myself was doing that on I my did team. That. I did that. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, he's doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and then it started catching on on our small little team. Awesome. So now the data scientists and front end people, um, they're like starting to put numbers with their issues and it's nice. It's nice to see that. Um, okay, I'll jump to the next slide. I only have four minutes. I'm having so much fun. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's um, great. So I did cover a lot of this. So on the last slide, it was things I wish I learned in college. I wish I knew Linux like really well. That would have helped me. Um, right now I'm programming. I'm scripting with uh, Vim. We have VS Code. <laughs> Um, it's set up in a different way where I don't want to use it. It's too slow. So I've been scripting in Vim and I'll pull up like 10 windows in Vim. Um, so you're like command line, command line, coding a lot, coding yeah, cool. exclusively. And it was a huge, when I had to switch over to doing that, when they didn't have VS code for like four months, it was a huge, um, stump to my progress. It was like two months. I just felt totally like. The keyword shortcuts, not using your mouse to click on everything, sounds really silly, but it really kept me from accomplishing things. Um, use Git on the command line too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a UI which sometimes I feel like I'm cheating. Like when you have to do a resolve a merge conflict, I still go to the command line <laughs> just because I want that. I just want that skill. I've been in environments where there is no UI for Git, so I just know that I'll need it again. Um, like I said, basic, two more minutes, basic networking. She had a question. Oh, sorry. So do we, what, what is preferable to use for Python? VS Code or Python? Or it's up to you. Yeah, like. What is preferable? Oh, to me? Yeah. I use VS Code. Um, but every team I've been on, when they ask, do you want us to use VS Code or PyCharm or something else? Mm -hmm. The answer is always just use like whatever works for you. Okay. Um, I think um, NeoVim or Vim is hard when you're trying to write an entire piece of software. And I think that's for like VS Code and PyCharm. Um, it helps with data science too, but yeah, I've had to pick and choose. <laughs> um, and basic networking concepts and containerization, this goes to like Docker and using like Nginx um, for like reverse proxies so customers can get to the, um, the doc the IP address and port um, that you need. And then just the part that I didn't touch on that you guys are probably all doing academic research. That was something brand new to me um, in my master's program. And it's a skill that I'm still trying to learn and um, it's very valuable. And I see my coworkers um, all have like PhDs and stuff. They use it and I'm always trying to learn from them. Like, hey, how'd you find that? Oh, okay, I'm gonna go and do that next time and um, leveraging open source documentation. And you can review these um, anytime you want. I don't want it to sound like a lecture, um, but these are things that I learned from managers over the years. Um, I'll tell one story since we're short on time, but um, always bring a pen and notepad to meetings. I went to a meeting one time and um, didn't bring a pen or notepad. It was it's not looking, it was not a very exciting meeting, let's just say. I didn't think I had to write things down. And um, the customer actually told my manager and said, hey, I think Sarah wasn't paying attention. She looked bored. I was very engaged in the meeting, but because I didn't have, I didn't like show that I was writing something down. Um, yeah, didn't look good on me. And thankfully it's been a good skill because there's a lot of times you end up writing things down that you wouldn't have remembered. Um, Does a laptop count as a notepad? I I can't I bring my go. <laughs> <laughs> well I can't bring my stuff into work like my machine right, into work right. so I'm yeah I'm using pen and paper <laughs> <laughs> got my coworkers on it too <laughs> um you don't believe people are actually taking notes when they have their laptop open now. <laughs> <laughs> as an instructor I can tell you we don't believe they're no. actually following <laughs> the instructions sending an email oh, yeah. yeah we know people are shopping because they have these like, <laughs> happy on their face they're like oh, and they click something and they're like but they look physical like why didn't that send and, yeah. and we know it's not what we're saying that uh, bringing happy looks or quizzical looks so. <laughs>
Yeah. It's pretty evident, but everyone thinks they're fooling the faculty. Yeah. <laughs> And I think the other thing is um, something that's worked for me is setting goals daily. As soon as I get to work or maybe as soon as you get to class or your start your day, write down everything you really like want to accomplish and then mark it off as you go and carry over your work. Um, yeah, there's a lot of nuggets. On Use here. a tool for that or is it just your notepad? My notepad. <laughs> yes. Like, um, in your defense, you're in a classified yeah, space, classify. so she can't be bringing cell phones or anything in there. But our interns were very um, hands-on. They had, you know, marked down documents for their notes and everything and totally impressed me. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good thing to do. <laughs> um, and then we can we could just skip my next steps because I'm still trying to figure out... Um, what I want to do next, um, as you can probably tell um, just from how I've been talking about things. There's a lot of things I want to learn. There's a lot of things I don't know. Um, so I really just want to continue to go like full in on my role um, and try to measure my progress against myself at the what's the next promotion up, like what would be expected from me there um, and try to bring myself up to that next step. So for performance reviews, when it time comes, you can say, hey, this is how I made progress against the next next level up. We're um, over time, but yes, does, do people you. have any last questions? You guys are all ready to go be data scientists <laughs> and wake up excited for work every day. <laughs> Hopefully. So. Um, and yeah, you guys can always review these slides if you just want something new to try. These are things that worked for me that were new. Yeah, thank you guys for your time. Oh, are there something popped up? Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Definitely. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Do you want me to?